Today we're back with Input Shaper Part 2. Hello everyone, Chris here, and yes, we're back with part two of our Input Shaper series. And just a bit of a recap, this is resonance compensation. This is an issue that you're going to have with every moving machine, and it can affect the print quality of your part. This is something we've talked about many times over the years. And in the last video, we just got Input Shaper set up enough so that you can start to realize the value of this feature. In this one, we're going to go over it just a little bit more in depth the different models you can use to set up Input Shaper, what to look out for, and a little bit more automated way to calibrate Input Shaper. Now, I thought it would be fun to start this video at some of the impressive failures that I had trying to get Input Shaper dialed in, just to give you an idea of the lengths that your machine is gonna go through during this calibration phase. So as we saw in the last video, when you're setting up Input Shaper, you're doing your initial tests, you're taking your accelerations to limits where you usually wouldn't, and you might see some layer shift, like with this Benchy right here. It was just a couple, but it did manage to complete the print. You can definitely see all the ringing on here. This is the part that Input Shaper is going to try to compensate for. All of that rigidness there. Or if you're not watching your printer close enough while you're tuning in Input Shaper, it might take it just a little bit too far. Talk about layer shifts, it kept shifting, it did complete the print, but it's pretty much all spaghetti. Or you might just create some artwork. This is currently my favorite fail of all time. The print started in the middle of the bed, it continued to layer shift all the way to the back of the machine, but was able to complete the print. It even skipped on the little smokestack there. This is art worth framing, and I think I'll do that. So that was just a little bit of fun, showing you the failures that I had while I was dialing in Input Shaper. Yeah, I took the printer just a little bit too far as far as acceleration goes. And again, this is a moving bed. It's an i3 style here on the Voron switch wire. So probably not the best machine to try to crank up the acceleration on, but I do think it's interesting to try to dial one of these in using this feature. Now let's move on to the different models that you have to choose from when using Input Shaper. Basically what this is, is the algorithm that it used to help calculate this. Some are going to be better than others on different styles of 3D printer. So in the first video, we did the initial input shaper calibration using a test print. But after that, you're going to start wanting to look at different input shaping models. There are several different ones with very specific use cases, but the main two that you want to look at are MZV and EI. And the biggest thing you need to know about these different models is how it does the smoothing and how it would interact with different kinematic setups of your 3D printer. One might be better for the moving bed i3 style, one might be better for Core XY. So definitely give a couple of these a test, and it's pretty easy to do. So basically, now that we have some input shaper values entered into our printer.cfg, and we can tell that it's working, you saw in the last video the differences in the before and after test models. These are our values right here. And by default, I just went with MZV as our shaper type. Now that might not be the shaper for you. There's all kinds of documentation on what does what as far as these shaping models. I find MZV is usually good for most 3D printers, but I wanted to give it a test anyway, just in case you needed to do it. So I highly recommend at this point, before you start testing different shapers, just go ahead and reset the printer in case there's configuration changes that were put in by either the tests or your config file that you don't necessarily want. So let's come up here to power and mainsail. Fluid's pretty much the same. And I'm just gonna do a reboot altogether. It's probably not a bad idea. This is going to do the whole Raspberry Pi. It takes a minute, but this will definitely clear out everything. For the most part, just a firmware restart would help as well but it's been a while since I rebooted this one. After your restart, we are going to once again set up to do some of our testing towers. So let's head over to console and we'll punch in some commands. Remember, all these commands are laid out in the Clipper documentation. You can just go over there and copy and paste. All that will be in the description. But once again, we're gonna set our velocity limit acceleration to decel to 7,000, just like we did before. So that gives us a maximum of 7,000 acceleration it's probably high enough for most 3D printer setups. 
We do want to make sure that pressure advance is turned off because that can conflict with some of the things that input shaper is going to do. Setting up pressure advance alongside input shaper is somewhat involved. We're going to do that at some point, but it's a little bit further down the road. So we're going to turn it off for now. And then you can run the command to set the input shaper. This is the algorithm or the shaper model that you want to use. First, we're going to test that MZV, the default one that I usually use on any input shaper setup. And then we want to run our tuning tower command. It is fairly long, but basically what this command is doing is getting us set up to run that test print. You saw that in part one. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back, watch that video, set up your print so you can get ready to start testing. So the tuning tower, we're going to set the velocity limit. Parameters we're interested in is Excel. We're going to start an acceleration of 1500. We're going to move up by 500 each step and the height is 5. And that will get us all the way to 7,000 on our test part. You can see the test part here in a moment when I show you what it looks like, but every increment it moves up just a little bit higher acceleration rate. So we'll enter that. And then you're ready to start your tests. So head to your g-code, your pre-sliced ringing tower, and just hit print. So now we're going to go back and start taking a look at these tuning tower prints one more time. This is a great time to go back and watch part one if you haven't. It is in the description. You're going to want to go through those steps to slice your part to be able to start this type of testing. But let's take a look at that MZV part first, just so you can compare with other models in Input Shaper. Just so you know a little bit more about what we're talking about from the last video, this is the test print we did. This is the Y axis print. This is without input shaper. You can see as it ratchets up through all the acceleration how the resonance changes with all these different ringing artifacts. And here's the part we just ran during that MZV test. Now remember, we have smoothing enabled. Input shaper has values in the config file. We did not turn them off. So you can see as it ratchets up through the different accelerations, you're still not getting much resonance. You can see it somewhere up in here where it starts to be a little bit more obvious, but it has it really under control. And again, this is the Y axis test. It's much greater on here because we do have a moving bed. So I didn't look at X. So we're not necessarily concerned with the ringing here for this test. We just want to look at the input shaper algorithm or the model. And we want the model that does the smoothing the best for our part, which it's doing pretty good for MZV, but also not overdoing it. And that's what this artifact over here is going to tell you. If you take a really close look as we ratchet up through acceleration, this would be 6,000, 6,500, 7,000. You can see that small gap right in there. That's at the point where the smoothing is too much you could start to see smoothing alter the dimensions of your part or causing some issues altogether. So this is how you kind of make a determination on what your acceleration should be and where you should stop. You don't want to over smooth things because that's not going to give you a very high quality print. It might look good, but might not be the best dimensionally. So you want to look down through here at where the acceleration versus the algorithm is giving you the best results. If you have a flashlight to put behind the part, it doesn't do the camera any favors here, but that can really help you see if there's any gaps. And if you go down through here, until about the middle of the part, you can still see some gaps in that artifact. So shaping might be overdoing it just a bit. So looking through all the artifacts with MZV, 4,000 is about where it looks best on the Y. Remember, you want to go back and take a look at X as well. I'm using Y as an example because it's the most exaggerated, but you could definitely see some gaps in some of these as well. Pick the one that looks the best. Depending on what you call fun, you could get out the USB microscope and have a look at your part. That makes the gaps just a little bit more obvious. This is 6,500 Excel. And there's 4,000. You can still see a tiny gap, but only at the microscopic level. 
And this was the part right here in the first video that I found it really challenging to tell you what acceleration you should be using with Input Shaper. Again, you want to be able to go as fast as you can with Input Shaper, but also get a quality part. There is a good mix here. And that artifact on the test print, based on the shaper you use, is going to be pretty telling. So give it a try, look at that artifact to help you decide how fast your 3D printer might be able to go with your input shaper settings. So let's move on to the next model and we'll look at the same print. So we tried MZV, the other one they suggest you give a shot is EI. Now there is a lot of documentation here again, but they recommend for a printer like the Switchwire with a moving bed that EI you give it a shot. It could help with the mass of that bed moving back and forth. Now personally, I have found that EI smooths just a little bit too much. I think MZV is a better balance, but go ahead and set up and run this test again. Run through all these commands, I highly suggest you go ahead and restart. Set up your acceleration, turn a pressure advance off, and then this command here, rather than using MZV, just put it to EI. And then go ahead and run your test print. If you find that one model of Shaper works better than the other, you can go into your printer config, like I showed you before, and just change that Shaper type. You don't even have to use the same one for X or Y. You can mix it up if you'd like. But let's take a look at that EI test part. So here's our EI run, and if you compare that to the video from the MZV run, I think the resonance is actually just a little bit better. It did a better job at smoothing that artifact, up at higher acceleration rates. This is 7000. You really can't see any ringing at all. But unfortunately, how it does its smoothing is pretty telling when you look at the other artifact. On this one, the gaps are very noticeable. So it's actually over smoothing the part. And this is the balance that I'm trying to stress here. You don't want to go over using Input Shaper if you don't have to. You can see right here, this is that 4000 mark that we were talking about with the MZV shaper. With the EI shaper, you can see a gap there. It's a lot greater than the other algorithm. So if I was going with this one, I would jump down to a 3500 Excel, maybe even a little lower than that. But keep this in mind when you're trying the different models in Input Shaper. Some might be better than others for certain circumstances. So the point I'm trying to get at here is when you're setting up Input Shaper, there's a lot of different knobs and switches that you can throw to get Input Shaper to do different things. And one use case is not going to be the same as the other. Now, I do think you should go ahead and give Input Shaper a try. Just to get it set up and see the benefit of it isn't that difficult, like I showed in the first video. But there's also a little bit different way to calibrate Input Shaper, and that's with an accelerometer. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it's easier to set up Input Shaper with Accelerometer because there is quite a bit of setup involved and there's different kinds of modules you can use to get this done. Sometimes you have to create your own wiring harness. After the setup, the calibration is really easy, but we have to get through that step first. So that's what we're going to take a look at now. Now, this is the accelerometer we're going to be using today. It's an ADXL345. There's a lot of different ones of these you can use, but in my opinion, this one's the most well-supported, there's the most information on it, and easiest to use. Now, I got mine with my Switchwire kit from LDO. This one has a module with the accelerometer, and you can use this ribbon cable over to another module that plugs into your Raspberry Pi. This is the other side right here. It plugs directly into your GPIO pins. These sensors are used with the SPI interface. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to get this done. You might have to create your own wire loom or purchase one of these kits. There's a lot of them out there. I highly suggest you get one that's pretty easy to use with your Pi. Now, there are a lot of boards that already support these. They have GPIO headers. Also, they have already a port that you can just cable up with something like a JST to use your accelerometer. So be on the lookout for this. If you need some help, leave me a comment but I highly suggest you get one that's already set up, ready to go. Now remember today we're using our switch wire. We have a moving bed back and forth, and then we have our tool head left and right. So you're gonna have to move that sensor and take different readings. So you're gonna need a mount that fits on the bed, and then you're gonna have to move your sensor over to the tool head, 
to get the X calibrated. And that's what you see here. This is a printed part so that we can put it on the front of the Voron on the tool head for X. And then we have this one here with a screw that you can clamp it down to the bed so that we can do Y. So we'll just move the sensor over there. But we'll start with X. So for this one, like I said before, we just have this ribbon cable attached to the accelerometer. And then the other side is going to go to my connector that fits on the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. We're using that SPI interface, and for this particular one, we have two pins down here that go all the way to the end of the GPIO. These are basically just to line you up, but they go on this far end. And when those two are lined up, you know these other eight down here are set up correctly to use that interface. A great little plug, if you can find one, I highly recommend it. As you can imagine in the Clipper documentation, they give you the pin out and the pins you need to use on your Pi to get these sensors set up. And it's not just for this one, there's a bunch of different accelerometers that you can use. Again, links in the description. So we'll attach the X setup first so we can test that. This mount is made so you can just remove these bottom two screws that hold the fan cover on and then attach the accelerometer in its place. And you want to install that as flat as you possibly can. It's not gonna matter a whole lot, but just get it close. Your module should have an X, Y, Z on it showing you the directions, the way you should orientate it. So this is installed well for X. So we can go ahead and do the software side of things. I will mention, this isn't something you want to attach all the time. Don't run this in your wire loom. You're only going to need this to adjust input shaper values. You would only want to come back and redo your values if you added or took away a lot of mass from one of the carriages. Most of the time, this is a one and done. So no need to put all that wire in there and get it installed and looking perfect. You want to remove it because you could possibly tear this ribbon cable. Now to get this whole thing set up, we are going to have to log into the Pi with an SSH tool and run some commands. There's different software you need to get this sensor working correctly on that GPIO. But I'm just going to use my putty tool and log into that Raspberry Pi or mainsail, however you want to look at it, and log in. Again, all these commands are available in the Clipper manual, but we're just going to go ahead and update all the repos, make sure we have all the correct ones. You will need your sudo password, which should be the same as the user you just logged in with. And then we're going to do a sudo apt install for Python 3. Just a few utilities in Python you're going to need to be able to use this sensor. Again, just copy and paste from the documentation. Then we're going to use a command to install Numphy in our Clipper environment. Basically, this is a package within Python that lets you do some calculations. It's needed to do these calculations we're going to get from our sensor. So we'll go ahead and do the install command. And then we're going to run some commands to set up our Raspberry Pi so that we can use our Linux MCU. And it's just a little bit complicated to explain. And it might just be me, but I always find this just a little bit hard to explain. So we have an MCU on our 3D printer mainboard. We talk to that mainboard from our Raspberry Pi with Clipper based on that device that we plug into our printer.cfg file. So you remember we take a look at that slash dev directory and we get that big long USB string that's the address that we're talking to our 3D printer mainboard with. Now, using a Linux MCU to talk to our sensor, we're actually using our Clipper or 3D printer mainboard as a secondary MCU. So now we can talk directly from Linux to our GPIO pins to talk to other devices. Now, that probably still doesn't make a whole lot of sense but basically, we're moving this MCU address so that we can use our GPIO to talk to other devices. This is how Clipper is able to talk to multiple main boards, if you would like, on your 3D printer. You can just keep using different addresses as different devices and use them all under the same OS. It's actually pretty cool if you look at the whole thing, but for today, just know that we're using this as a Linux MCU for our accelerometer. Let's get back to it. So back to SSH, we need to run some commands so that we can make that happen. So we can basically offload this as a secondary MCU so we can start talking to our Linux MCU, or our virtual MCU, as it were. 
Now, Clipper has scripts to make this easier for you to do. It does all the work for you, and you're not going to hurt your Clipper install. It's going to work the same after we do this. It's just going to allow us to use this GPIO pens. So we're going to change directory into Clipper. And then we're going to copy a script over to the init.d folder so that it can be started on boot. Again, just copy and paste these commands from the documentation, but we're sudo cp or copy from scripts clipper mcu start.sh into etc init.d clipper mcu. Again, just so we can start this at boot. We'll hit enter. And then we need to update rc.d so that it knows about this new script so that it can start it. sudo update dash rc.d clipper underscore mcu defaults. Now we need to build some firmware for that Linux MCU, just like you would for a mainboard. So make sure you're in the Clipper directory, and we're just going to run a make menu config. Again, just like setting up Clipper. We'll get our menu, and all we need to know is make sure you don't have to enable extra low level. Just make sure your microcontroller architecture is set to the Linux process. That will allow us to talk to those GPIO pens. You can see in here all the different main boards, the different processors, MCU. We want Linux process. And we can hit escape. If you need to make changes, you'll just hit Y to save it. Make sure you save it. And then we can stop the Clipper service. sudo service Clipper space stop. And then do a make space flash to get our firmware for our virtual MCU ready. And then we can go ahead and start Clipper. sudo service Clipper start. To verify that that worked, you have your Linux MCU ready to go. Do an ls forward slash temp, TMP. You'll see your Clipper host MCU. That just lets you know that now we have a device that we can access those GPIO pens. And since we're using that ADXL sensor, it uses the SPI interface. You want to verify that SPI is enabled. You can do that with sudo raspi-config. Go into interface options, number three. Number four is SPI. Just go ahead and hit it. It'll ask you if you want to enable it. Hit yes. It is enabled. We will have to have that to talk to that sensor. So we can hit finish. Now would be a great time to go ahead and reboot just to make sure everything's set up correctly. And then we can start talking to that sensor. Now, if you've done your reboot, main sales back up, clippers running, we're talking to the printer, everything's running okay. We need to go set up that MCU in our printer.cfg so that we can talk to it. That Linux MCU. So let's go to machine. We'll go to printer.cfg. Here's what I was talking about before, that serial address for the MCU. That's the one on your printer board. Just think of this one like the same thing. It's just a different type of device. And I like to set my sensor up again underneath printer config. I just think it makes more sense down here. But you're going to want a line that says MCU space RPI. And then its serial address will be where we installed that new MCU slash temp, slash clipper, underscore host, underscore MCU. And the reason why I think this ADXL345 is the easiest one to use is because it has the least amount of configuration lines that you need to add. Basically, you configure it as an ADXL345 here in brackets, and then you just have to tell it where its CS pin is. So just give it a CS pin, colon, RPI, colon, none. And then you need to tell the configuration what your resonance tester is. So resonance underscore tester. We're using an accelerometer underscore chip, ADXL345. And then pick your probe points. Where would you like this accelerometer to be when it does its test? I recommend you do it over the bed, about 20 millimeters, but right in the center. Switch wire is 250 by 210. So I'm going to go right in the middle. 125, 105, and then 20 millimeters over the bed. Again, just the location where it will do the test. 
And when you have that set up, we've already got some input shaper values down here, but we're going to override those when we do the auto configuration with our accelerometer. You'll see that in just a second. But go ahead and hit save, restart, and we'll pull in the new values. After everything's rebooted, we've got our configuration ran. You will see your MCU for your main board right here. And then your MCU RPI, Linux, for your sensor right here. So no errors, everything's configured correctly. And since we're going to just use the same sensor, we're going to test X, then move it to Y, then test Y. Just go to console to make sure your sensor's working. You can do an accelerometer underscore query. If you get your values back, you know we're receiving information from your accelerometer and we're ready to start our testing. So in my opinion, the hard part's done. I think the secondary MCU is a little hard to understand, but again, most of this you can just copy and paste those commands, follow along with what I did, and everything should work correctly. I think this ADXL sensor is way easier to use than a lot of the others. But from here, the tests are very straightforward. So let's go ahead and fire one up on the X, since that's where we currently have the sensor installed. So before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and home all, so it knows where to go when it's going to do its test. And there's a couple of different ways to kick off these tests. There is an automated way with a shape calibrate. I want to walk through all the steps so I can explain what they do. So we're just going to test resonance and then I will show you the additional steps that you need to take to get the graph and do all these other things just so you understand. If you're familiar with this and you just want it to do everything for you, go ahead and take a look at shape calibrate. But we're going to test resonance, test underscore resonance space axis equals X. What this is going to do is run through a bunch of different frequencies, basically moving the print head side to side to simulate said frequency, measuring it with the accelerometer. And it's going to make a good estimate about where the butter zone might be as far as acceleration and frequency. So let's kick it off and we'll see what it does. It's not going to be super obvious at the beginning, but you do want to keep watching the printer while this test is running just to make sure nothing crazy happens because the vibrations can get somewhat violent. You can see the movements get shorter and shorter. In the console, you can see the current frequency that it's testing. It's so violent at this time, it's actually starting to move the camera a bit. The test is done. We went all the way from zero Hertz to 133 and now it's doing the calculations. When they're done, it's going to give you a CSV file in your temp directory that you can take a look at. Clipper has a calibration Python script that will actually turn this into a graph so you can take a look at the results. It makes just a little bit more sense, plus it's kind of fun to look at. So if you head to SSH, we can run that script. It's in Clipper scripts. It's called calibrateshaper.py. If you do an ls slash temp, that will show you the name of that CSV file. You can get it from the console as well, but I just want to show you how to get it. This is the file right here. So we'll pull up that command. Remember, up arrow will repeat the commands for you. And then we just need to overtype the name of the file we just generated. It has the date and time. And then you can call that PNG, the image file with the graph, whatever you'd like. I just leave it default. It's going to make that graph for you but then also give you recommendations for each shaper model that's available and what frequency you might want to set that at. You saw from our testing before, I really like the MZV. So this is the recommended value for that shaper model, 43 Hertz. So quite a bit off of what we set it to with our manual calculation, but then it also gives you too much smoothing. They want you to avoid max acceleration 5600. On the test part, I was looking at around 4000. But these values should be a lot more accurate than just doing it by eye on that test part. But let's go ahead and take a look at that graph to see what it looks like. The easiest way to go grab that and take a look at it is to use WinSCP. If you're familiar with Clipper, you probably already know how to use this tool. Basically, we're logging in so we can grab some files from the Raspberry Pi and take a look at them on our PC. So we'll just SCP 
into our Raspberry Pi address, the one running Clipper, and it's in temp, so you might need to go up a few directories. TMP is what we're looking for, and there's our Shaper Calibrate XPNG file. That's what we want. So I'll right click on a download that to my desktop, and then we can just pop it open and take a look. And here's the results from that test run. All these different dotted lines are different shaper methods that you can use, shaper models, and it gives you the recommendations like we saw there in the SSH tool. So MZV, you can see as it works through all the different frequencies, and over here is the vibration reduction ratio that it's gonna suggest at each one of those increments. So you can see this MZV, we plummet all the way down in here. This is our recommended frequency at around 43.6. So this is going to be the value to give you the best result using Input Shaper, given the mass of this tool head. It's a pretty interesting process all in all. So what I suggest you do is either save that graph or just copy these values right here. We still do have to test Y, but we'll come back to this. So now that we have some numbers for X, I'm going to take this sensor off and move it to our Y mount. So I've got the sensor moved over to the Y mount. This just clamps down on top of the bed. It should be good enough to get a pretty accurate value on a movable bed printer, an i3 style like this. I would just suggest you put it in the center somewhere and test it with the sheet on because the sheet does add mass. So our sensor's on, it's pointing in the right direction. We'll go ahead and start the Y test. We'll home again and it's the same command, just change your axis to Y. And the test starts. The test is complete. Again, we stopped at 133 hertz. And then it's going to calculate, make that CSV file, and then we can check it out again, just like we did for X. If we head back to Putty, we'll just take a look at temp again to get our file name. There's our resonance Y file. We'll just run that same command again to generate the image. We just need to update the file name. So I'll just delete this section. I'll hit Y. And since it's the only one in there, I can hit tab and it'll complete it for us. And then just rename that image from X to Y. And we'll do the same thing. It's going to generate it and give us some suggestions right here in the terminal. You can see right here, MZV, it's suggesting 46 hertz, maximum acceleration 6200, which seems fairly high. but the frequency was actually a lot closer to what we saw in the manual test. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this again, but we'll take a look at that graph. Back to WinSCP, here's our Y file, I'll download that guy, and we can take a look. They're giving us the same type of estimate here, but it is kind of fun to see how all of them match up, the different models, and the swings that it takes, but there's where we landed for MZV model. So now you've seen how to set up the accelerometer to get some values to plug into input shaper. But don't take that acceleration value as what you should be printing at. That's the absolute maximum as far as it measured based on that frequency. You're still going to want to be very conservative about your max acceleration. Most of the time 3000 is going to be quite a bit, especially for a printer like this one where the bed moves around. So I suggest you start at that value, see how input shaper is working, and then go from there. Also, before you run these tests, make sure your 3D printer is set up, ready to print, even where the surface that you're printing it on is set up how you would normally be set up, because that can skew these results. You remember from our older video where we tested the cement block and the shaky table? That's going to make a difference while running these tests. For example, the switch wire usually sets on a couple of rubber feet. That's enough to skew these results. So keep that in mind, and I suggest you run tests, maybe five of them, compare the averages because they're all going to be just a little bit different, then plug in your input shaper number. So now let's move to printer.cfg, see where we were and where we're at now. So these are the values that I got from Putty after we ran that calibration with the accelerometer. Now remember what I just said, this printer is not set up in the optimal location. I don't even have the feet installed right now. I just wanted to run those tests to show you how to do it. So these values probably aren't anywhere near accurate. But from your testing, 
After you've done it a couple of times and you get a nice solid number or an average of numbers, then you would just head over to printer.cfg. Here's the input shaper section that we used when we did the manual calibration, but just over type for X and Y, and then you should be all set. Remember, you do have your shaper type. I am using that MZV because I think it does the best job on this printer, but it might be different for yours. Just over type it here. The only other thing you need to be concerned about is backup and printer settings, and that's max acceleration. I had this set to 6000 just to see what it would do during my test, but don't make the max excel any higher than what that input shaper suggested. You don't want it even near that high. I suggest you start with 3000, see how input shaper is doing, and if you really feel necessary, go ahead and bring it up from there. Just keep that in mind when you're tuning your 3D printer, you're not going to be able to achieve those accelerations that input shaper suggested. So when you're done tweaking the settings, go ahead and hit save and restart, and you should be all set to do a test print with your new input shaper values. Okay, sorry, I couldn't leave it there. I had to go ahead and test one more time. So I got the switch wire all set up with the rubber feet on it. I positioned it on the table so I thought it was nice and square and I reran the test. Really, they weren't that far off from our original test with the accelerometer. I ended up with a 47 for X and a 44.2 for Y. And then I wanted to run a couple of tests. One with these numbers for the manual configuration we did in the first video, and then with these numbers. Now, I did use the MZV as the model for the shaper on both of these. That's not actually the recommended shaper. If you take a look at Putty one more time, when we did the Y, it recommends the 2-Hump EI, which I don't know much about, but I might try that again, reset, use that model, and see if it makes a difference. But I did want to at least compare the manual versus the accelerometer calibration. And here's what the prints look like. This one was with manual, this one with the accelerometer. Both of these took 54 minutes to print, and the artifacts as far as resonance, what the shaping introduced, is pretty much the same. We can get a good close look here. This is the manual without the accelerometer, and this is the last calibration that I did with. And you might think these bidgies don't look so good. Well, it's mostly because they're PLA and the cooling. We turned auto cooling off, so it's not able to cool it good enough to lay down that PLA before it lays down the next layer. But as far as the input shaping calibration goes, they're almost identical. I did set my printer up for 3000 acceleration for these tests, so nothing crazy, but it really doesn't seem to matter one way or the other. We'll keep testing. So there we go. With these two videos, if you're running Clipper firmware, this should give you the basics to get you set up and running Input Shaper. No matter if you're using the manual version where you're printing something out and checking it by eye, or using your accelerometer. Now, the accelerometer takes just a little bit more to get set up and running, but I think it does give you a lot better set of values you can use to improve your 3D prints. And on that note, I am just focused on increased print quality here, not necessarily speed. If you want to go that route, you probably shouldn't be using an i3 style 3D printer. Check out something that's more Core XY and maybe a drop bed. We just want better print quality. Maybe a print speed bump would be a bit of an advantage, but those kind of go hand in hand. Be conservative with your input shaper and acceleration settings. And we haven't even touched the surface with input shaper. What if you have a 3D printer that came with Clipper on it? How do you get Input Shaper up and running on one of those? Also, it's available in Marlin and RepRap. We have to check all of that out as well. What if you have a Marlin 3D printer that's already running, getting good print quality, you just want to make it even better? We've got to implement Input Shaper there too. So that's it for today. A lot more to come on Input Shaper. Hopefully you found this video helpful, and I'll see you really soon on the next one.